Wonderful, beautiful. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, chap, uh, chapter 27, verses 3 through 10. Verses 3 through 10. All right, Elizabeth, how much longer we got to wait on that boy? Huh? A month. One more month. All right. I'll take your word for it. All right. <laughs> One more month and we'll have another baby boy. We're getting a lot of boys right now. So maybe some of the other couples need to get busy and give us some girls. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Matthew 27, verses 3 through 10. If you would stand with us, please, together. We like to read together out loud, so if you'll join along with me. I still hear a couple of pages turning, so Matthew 27, verses 3 through 10. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potters filled to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they, the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for your wonderful love and mercy. But Father, we know that sin has a price to pay. And this morning as we look at this passage, we should understand the severity of sin in our life. I pray that each one of us will look at ourselves in the mirror of your word today and Father, uh, work on our own lives and work with things in our life, Father, so that we reach not the point that Judas reached. And Father, this should be a lesson to all of us. If there's anyone in this room that does not, the Lord, does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, we pray that today would be the day of salvation. Father, we pray that you would work in our hearts now. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to talk to you about sin when it is finished. The Bible tells us that sin, when it is finished, bring forth death. Sin brings death. We learn that when we study the book of Genesis, we see Adam and Eve in the garden. What brought death to them? It was sin. And we read in Romans, it talks about how that is one man sinned, then death passed upon all men, for that all men have sinned. So we understand the wages of sin is death. But this is a unique story here, thinking of Judas. Judas is an interesting character. Uh, first of all, James, he was the church treasurer. <laughs> in case you don't know, he's our church treasurer, so I'm picking on him a little bit. Uh, but he had the privilege, imagine, being one of the twelve, traveling with Christ, going wherever Christ went, and they were allowed to go. He was there, as far as we know. He sat down with the Lord Jesus during the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper. Communion. So he saw the miracles, uh, he saw the, the wonderful uh, teachings of Christ and witnessed the people who were learning those things. And he had the privilege of being what we call today an insider. Uh, you know, sometimes that's the case. People have inside people and everybody else else is outside. And he had the privilege of being inside because he was with Christ as much as he could, as much as he wanted. I noticed today, though, that people usually don't name their child Judas. Matter of fact, if, if you use the term, that person is a Judas, you know what they mean. It's very common usage in today's language here in America. I don't know about other countries, but I know here it is. Uh, you're not supposed to be a Judas. 
You're not supposed to betray that which is good and right. You're not supposed to betray your friends. Jesus was his friend. We learn here that, that Judas was an example of utter failure. Let me ask you a question. Do you think you've ever betrayed Christ in your life? I'm sure some of our actions, we've denied Christ, like Peter did. Uh, the Bible the, it tells us the Bible is here for an example. You and I, we should be learning from the example of these people in the Bible. And I heard someone, oh, the Bible's just full of all these stories of wicked people. And I said, that's right, it is. But it's so that you and I can learn how we're supposed to live and how we're not supposed to live. We can also learn the results of our lives. And uh, this is a tragic, tragic life uh, Judas had. The Bible says he was never saved. You ever heard somebody say, Judas lost his salvation? No, he didn't. That's right. He never had it. Right. He was a fake believer. That's right. And the Bible says he was of his son. He was the son, uh, the son of the devil. He was the son of perdition. From the very beginning, it says. Judas was never saved. So mark that down. That's something you need to know. He did not lose his salvation. So please, if you use Judas, for example, remember, he did not get saved. Right. And I'm sure today in heaven, I mean, excuse me, in hell, he is counting pieces of silver over and over and over again. Perhaps that's his lot for the rest of his eternal life, eternal death, really. All right? So that's where Judas is. Uh, the other disciples, they weren't perfect, and they made mistakes. But the other disciples did not sell Jesus out. I have no respect for politicians today that sell us out. There are politicians today that are selling us out. They're giving us up. Uh, and it's for their own profit and gain, most of it. You notice how almost all the politicians, even the liberals who say they want to help all the poor, if you pay any attention... They want to take your money and give it to everybody else. I'll guarantee you they have no intention of giving up their medical coverage. And many of these men that are saying all this are worth billions or millions anyway. Do you see them reaching in their pocket and going down to the rescue mission? Matter of fact, most of these people, if you look at their, their, uh, their giving records, you will discover they give very, very little, if any, to those in need. But don't, don't be a Judas. Don't sell yourself out for something else. Don't sell what Christ represents. Don't sell him out. Tragic end when you do that. The Bible says there is a sin that's a sin unto death. Please make sure, first of all, this morning that you're saved. Now let's, look, let's first of all look at the defilement of Judas. The defilement of Judas. In verses 3 through 5. Um, I'm sure that Judas, since he was not saved, did not understand maybe everything about what he was doing. Because if you notice, as you read this passage, it's like, oh, they're going to kill Jesus. What have I done? He becomes to himself, he begins to realize. It says, then Judas, in verse 3, which had betrayed him when he saw that he, Christ, was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders. So you think about these past few hours, and, and, and he's beginning to think about this. Uh, he had just broke bread in the upper room with Christ and the disciples and spent time with them. Um, and he was dismissed of Jesus. Remember what Jesus told him? Go carry out your devious plan. Remember what he said? Go do it. That which you do, do quickly. Go sell me out. Now, of course, that proves, again, the deity of Christ. Christ right. knew that Judas was a traitor from the very beginning. And he knew that even though Judas had a choice, God knew what was going to happen. Some people, Judas didn't have a choice. Now, what kind of God in heaven would that be to not allow mankind to have a choice over right and wrong? How could God judge us? if there was no ability to judge between right and wrong. But God knew he was going to do it. And God knew, and Christ knew. 
And so here he is, this guy's enjoyed all this. And what happened is, is he knew where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying and getting ready for the cross that lied ahead. And Judas came with the Roman shoulders, soldiers, led him to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he betrayed Christ with a kiss. With a kiss. What does a kiss mean to you? Teenagers, you're not supposed to know yet. Except for a kiss from mom and dad, right? Or grandma and grandpa. A kiss is supposed to represent love. Right? Isn't that what a kiss is? A sign of affection. That's what a kiss is. And Jesus was betrayed with a kiss. That was the sign to the Roman soldiers. This is Jesus. And of course they came and arrested him and took him uh, away to be judged. And he knew then, all of a sudden, that, that Christ is going to suffer crucifixion. And Christ was in it. All of a sudden, as, as Judas is in there dealing with these men, trying to give back the 30 pieces of silver, trying to undo what he did. Let me tell you, there are some sins that a person commits in their lives, and once that ball gets rolling, you can't stop it. You know what abortion is. Abortion is a way of doing a Judas with a child. Betraying your own child. You're trying to cover a sin with killing a life. It's a betrayal to the family. It's a betrayal to the Word of God and certainly a betrayal to Jesus. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. How can they come if you kill them? I'm really hot on, on, on this thing of abortion right now. We're winning ground, folks. I don't know if you know this. In America, we're beginning to get some ground back that we've lost. And state after state after state is making it illegal. But you can believe, can you believe this? Every Democratic candidate for the presidency of the United States, every one of them believes in abortion. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they all believe in abortion after birth. Where they kill the child after he's been born. That's what we've come to in this country. We have betrayed everything. Christians get in. I say that loosely. I don't know how a Christian can kill. I don't know how a Christian can vote for any candidate that believes in abortion. I give the Smiths a hard time about their new baby, but I guarantee you it's their first baby, and they wouldn't let any harm come to that child at all. Life is more precious to you now than it ever has been. Just to hold that little child in your hands and to believe that's what God has given you. Then I think of families in our church that would love to have children that haven't been able to have children. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get off on that track, but I'm just upset. I'm just, I just can't believe that the people that call themselves Christians that vote for candidates. A lot of what it is is you're a prostitute. You're letting these guys buy your votes for what you want otherwise. I'm sorry, let me move on. The defilement of Judas. He realized, and also we see his regret in verse 3, that Judas betrayed him when he saw that Christ was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So here we see uh, an important aspect of this tragic account. He was thinking about all these events and all these things that had taken place. And you notice what he says there is that Jesus is an innocent man. Even Judas understood that Christ had done no wrong, no sin, anything. He was God in the flesh. And Judas is understanding and he's sorry for what he's done. And when that word repent here doesn't mean what we talk about when repentance towards salvation. Because we don't see that taking place here. He's sorry, but he's sorry he got... Caught with his hand in the cookie jar. Right. You know, I, I dealt with our Christian school for many years as principal, and Pastor Burden's done it, and he'll back me up, and now you'll back me up, James, with our Christian school, is a lot of kids come in and they try to repent, but they're not repenting because they're really sorry that they stole the uh, pencil money or something like that. They're only sorry they got caught. Right. The Bible talks about a worldly sorrow in Corinthians. One that causes you to really repent and be sorry and turn away from what you've done. Not just that you got caught. And that's what's happening here. Judas is just 
He's not repenting like we think of repent. Most people today, that's their attitude. They engage in sin, even enjoy it, no consequence they think, and then boom, all of a sudden they get caught. Then the sorrow comes. They regret getting caught. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to get Judas right with God. Now let me ask you a question. Had Judas gone to Christ to truly repent, what would Christ have done? He would have forgiven him. Something to think about, isn't it? But we see the results. That's not what he does. His regret draws, draws, uh, drives him to kill himself. Let me say this this morning. Most sin, when it is finished, will drive you to the point of death, either through the results of that particular sin. Do you realize that today we would not have a problem with AIDS? By the way, AIDS is still everywhere. I don't know if you know that. They just don't talk about it in the news anymore. It's still an epidemic, and it's still a problem. AIDS kills. Sin kills. And, uh, you know, you have people that, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And what they expect God to do is just reach down and clear everything up. Sin doesn't do that. Sometimes sin has consequences that you and I could never erase. You smoke and smoke and smoke and smoke, and you hear a preacher saying it's not good for you. You're destroying the temple of God. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You shouldn't smoke. Smoking won't send you to hell, but it sm makes you smell like you've been there. You know, and it's not a good habit. It's not something that Christians ought to do. It's a bad testimony. One day you come up with uh, cancer of the lungs or some other cancer from smoking. You know, I think of Tony Gwynn. What a ball player Tony Gwynn was. Mr. Padres. He is considered one of the best Padres that ever put the uniform on. He was good to the community. He was a nice guy, but he wouldn't quit dipping snuff. You know, a little pinch of tobacco during the games. formed cancer and it killed them. Sin does that. And did you realize that sin will even drive you to kill yourself? One of the problems with homosexuality they will not discuss on television is how many homosexuals commit suicide. The last I read, the, the county in America that, that is the number one county for suicides is Marin County in the Bay Area. The seat of homosexuality, which is, has more psychologists, psychiatrists than any other place per capita in the U.S. And people are still committing suicide. Sin causes you to commit suicide. That's what happened here. That was the end result for him. Look at his response. Judas brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. He's trying to stop the ball from rolling, but it's too late. It's already going. He cannot give the money back and undo what he's done. Christ is already arrested. Christ is already standing trial. It's too late. That's what sin does. Seems attractive, seems good, seems nice, but when you give in to it, it ends up hurting you in the end. Sin is not good. Look at the life of Judas. He tried to do, undo his wrongs, and it never resulted in a salvation for him. You and I today, we cannot undo our wrongs and expect salvation. I got a dear friend, and he's so confused about the atonement of Christ and what the Bible says about how Jesus shed his blood to give us forgiveness of sins. And I've been working on him and working on him. Can't get it through his head. And he's always talking about repentance, meaning the wrong kind of repentance. Biblical repentance is turning from the life that you were living from serving sin and instead serving Christ. I'm going to follow Christ now. That's, we don't see that in Judas. All he's trying to do is undo, by his own works, undo the results of what he's done. Too late. Can't be done. Cannot be done. You can try to undo your wrongs all you want. It will never result in salvation. Now let me say this. That doesn't mean that it's not right to undo things that you've done that you can undo. You know, you think about 
the tax collector. He was told by Christ, take your money, go back and pay back all those. And he went out and he paid back fourfold, which was the law of all the money he stole from people as a tax collector. But first he got saved. First he accepted Christ. He wanted to be Christ's disciple. Look at his rejection. Verse 5, And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So Judas rejected Christ one last time and then went out and hung himself. You see, the very act of suicide denies faith in Christ. When we've sinned by faith, we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. When we're living a sinful life and we're not saved, we understand we have to give our heart to Christ and follow Christ. But instead, he decided he'd hang himself. Now let me tell you the worst side of that. The worst side of committing suicide is he woke up in hell. Now, I know there are some folks that call suicide the unpardonable sin, and that's not what the Bible says. The unpardonable sin is uh, attributing the works of the devil to Christ. You read the passage, you'll understand that. However, I don't know. Can a Christian commit suicide? Good question. King Saul did. Was King, was King Saul saved? You have to ask yourself that first. Um, some people say yes, they can. And some people say no, he can't. I'm not going to judge it because the Bible is not specific on it. I'll be honest. I can't find a definite answer in the scriptures. But I do know it's not the will of God to commit suicide. Amen. The will of God is to have faith in Christ and turn your life to Christ. And he will help you. Um, but he rejected Christ. He hung himself and he woke up in hell. He's all... For all eternity, Judas is lost. Now let's look also at the resentment of the priest. The priest had their part in this whole thing. Don't forget that. Um, first of all, we see their apathy. I've been trying to build a sermon on apathy, and I just haven't come to the point where I can exactly get the scriptures together and the thoughts together. I want, maybe I'm too apathetic, apathetic myself. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, today we have apathy in our country, don't we? I don't care. Isn't that the way people talk? I don't care. Famous word now? Whatever. Well, that's a sign of apathy. We see here that the priest who was supposed to religious rulers be religious rulers instead of endeavoring to help Judas, ah, what's that to do with us? Your problem, Judas. You took the money, you go. They didn't care. What? It said, uh, saying, I have sinned and that I betrayed the innocent blood... And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. In other words, you go fix your own problem. You fix your own problem. You know, that's what the devil does to us. He tempts us. He gives us opportunities to do wrong. And we submit. And then does he care? Not one bit. It's like bad friends. You have bad friends. They get you in trouble. You think they care? They throw you under the bus is what they do. Uh, I tell you one thing I'd like to stop it just doesn't seem right to me. That is district attorney offices plea bargaining with known criminals and murderers and lightening their sentence to convict someone else. They all need to go to jail. They all need to be punished. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches. All right, let's move on here. Um, so... The priests were resenting and they, they were full of apathy. They really didn't care. They just don't care. Um, a lot of Christians today, you don't care. You're apathetic. Isn't that sad? You know, there were enough Christians in this country to have stopped the election of certain men in the office. But they didn't vote. Didn't go vote. Eh, whatever, I don't care. It doesn't really matter. It does matter. It does matter. You know, the Philippines is a good example. The Philippines, how many of y'all remember there was a time we had army bases and uh, navy bases and things like that there in the Philippines? And, and uh, beautiful, I've seen the results of those bases. Beautiful Air Force base there at Clark Field. And uh, they had a, a referendum on the ballot 
about whether or not to allow U.S. to stay in the Philippine Islands. And so when they voted, one person voted no. Had he voted yes, it wouldn't have passed. Now, the Philippines have been hurting ever since. We lost good bases over there, by the way, millions of dollars in the process that we've invested. Uh, but the point is one vote. Christians, don't be apathetic about anything. Don't be apathetic about your church or the members of your church. Do you really care that we have two ladies in our church that are fighting for their lives against cancer? Do you care? Miss Jan is really bad off, folks. If you haven't caught on, she'll probably try to be here tonight, but in the morning she just can't get going. She's in immense pain. Cancer. Another lady's in her Spanish ministry, and she's fighting cancer, taking treatments, and then her brother over here in the back, he's fighting cancer. Do you care? Are you apathetic? Apathy's a horrible sin as far as I'm concerned. We all should care. Then we see their hypocrisy. The chief priest in verse 6 took the silver pieces and said, it is not law for us for us to put them into the treasury because it is a price of blood. Okay? So someone sold, one, someone sold someone else out and it's going to cost our lives. Blood is going to be shed so we can't take this money <coughs> that was used. We can't take it back. We can't put it into the treasury. Well, I tell you, some churches could use this principle today, by the way, <laughs> taking in the money from wrong sources. Politicians could definitely use this today about not taking money from the improper sources. But here was preachers, basically, priests, the religious rulers of the day. And they even realized we cannot take this money. So they went out and they bought a potter's field, the Bible says, which, by the way, is fulfillment of Scripture. You think about this. That here, in Judas' action, is fulfillment of Scripture, and he didn't even notice what was going on. <coughs> A lot of people didn't know what was going on, and it was found in the book of Jeremiah. And it talks about, Jeremiah said that's what was going to happen. They were going to take that money, and they were going to give it to buy a field for strangers to be buried in. I thought about this a little bit. I'm not a deep thinker. I try, but I can't get too deep. My plow's not too sharp anymore. <laughs> but, you know, this is a great illustration of Christ's love for the rest of the world. So it couldn't be used for Jews, but it could be used for strangers. Huh? Those who are not Jews get salvation from Christ. I think this is a neat picture of our salvation, uh, those of us that are not Jews. We're not part of the elect, yet we were grafted in because Christ then extended salvation to all those outside of the Jewish group. What a tremendous story. So not only their hypocrisy, because they went out and did all the, the way they did it, we see their conspiracy, and they took counsel, took counsel, they conspired and they bought the potter's field to bury strangers in. It's called the field of blood. And I'm glad I'm in the field of blood. Amen. My sins have been covered by the precious blood of Jesus. You know, I really get angry today when I hear people deny the blood atonement of Christ. If there is no blood atonement, there is no salvation. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Christ was going to shed His blood on the cross. Our sins... Uh, we're going to, be, going to be covered by His blood. Jesus is making the perfect sacrifice that God will forgive us of our sins through His blood. So this tremendous fulfillment of Scripture. Judas kissed the door of salvation. Think about that. Jesus is the door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, Judas kissed him. But he was really betraying them. Let's look at the sovereignty of God in this. And in verse 10 it says, And gave them for a potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Here's one thing that you and I need to understand today, that God is God. I am not a Calvinist. 
Okay, I don't think that God made Judas do what he did. I have some people, that's what they teach. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Every man has a free will. We get to choose what's right or wrong. But God already knows. It's in the scriptures. Jesus is coming again. It's in the scriptures. We can read it. We can study it. We know that I believe with all my heart there's going to be a rapture and the Christians will be gathered together, taken out of this world. Seven years will happen right after that where the world will fill the judgment of God upon this earth. It's going to be a horrible time to exist on earth. The Bible says it. I believe it. The prophecy is true. God is God. God does not lie. God does not change. And even though Judas did that which was wrong, God has in turn used it for good. We can't stand here today and say, praise Judas, because Judas did the right thing. Judas did not do the right thing. But God knew it was going to happen, and God prophesied it, and it did bring about the crucifixion of Christ. Well, what if Judas didn't do it? Then it had been somebody else. The Bible was going to be fulfilled. Let me ask you this this morning. Where do you stand with Christ? Are you a personal friend of Jesus? A lot of people say, I know Jesus, I love Jesus. Judas knew him, dwelt with him, kissed him, but yet he was a traitor. Ask yourself this morning, would you be a traitor to Christ? Oh, no, Pastor, I, I don't think I would ever do that. Not me, I would stand firm. Would you? Do you stand firm? Do you stand firm today as a Christian on your faith in Christ? What are you going to do when the government comes and says, you can no longer be a Christian in America? Oh, pastor, that will never happen. You think not? Look what's going on in the world today. I think we might be in the middle of a beginning of some kind of a spiritual revival where people will have a last opportunity to give their life to Christ. And then after that, the judgment comes. I can't promise you that we won't face troubles and trials and tribulations. The Bible said there would be tribulations. Not the tribulation, but we might face tribulations until Jesus comes and takes us home. Where do you stand in all that? If the trumpet were to sound today, are you a real Christian? Do you know you're going to heaven? If instead they come in here and say, all you guys are practicing Christianity, we're going to take you away. Now, I, I, I don't mean to scare you folks, but I'll tell you, you do some research and see how many Muslims are moving into the government of the United States. They are actively spending the, more, the money that we use to buy their oil and everything else. They're spending that to propagate Muslim philosophy and religion. It's everywhere. Schools are allowing it to be taught in their schools, but they won't let me come in and teach the gospel of Christ. We are being, beginning to get persecuted. Where would you stand? If, G if Judas could be with Christ to do all that, then here, here's the difference, all right? You may know Christ, but does Christ know you? Remember in the New Testament, when Jesus was talking about, he would say, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. You never were my child. Does Christ know you? Have you really given your life to Christ? Are you faithful? Have you followed him? It's a tragic account. You think about, you know, it's kind of negative. You know, you Baptist preachers, you like negative preaching. Well, it's all in the Bible. I'm sorry. And the purpose of it is to get us to wake up. These are wonderful, wonderful, true biblical accounts of things that happen so that we might change our lives and learn. There are examples for us. We don't want to be a Judas. What's some examples of being a Judas? Well, when you're out, and sin is going on around you, and you say nothing. You deny, basically deny Christ. Do you have a track rack? Do you have 
Bible tracts in your pocket. I do that a lot now when I hear people taking the Lord's name in vain or something. I just kindly hand them a tract. <laughs> Are you apathetic and don't care like the priest? Because you may not be like Judas, you might be like the priest. Eh, whatever. Let's face it, folks. Bible churches as we know it today is on the decline. There are some churches that are doing well, but I'm going to tell you, they're fighting tooth and nail to do well. A lot of the churches that we once knew that were fundamental and sold out and serving God are gone, or they've sold out and they're going the other direction. There are churches that I used to visit for meetings I can't go to anymore. We're living in the days when it's either serve God or not. And we have to make that choice. Let's stand together, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed.